it has been a journey for me to get to this point as we wrap up this series, Who Do You Say That I Am? Looking at the attributes and the names of Jesus, our Savior, our Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King. And I hope it's been a good journey for you as well. I hope that you've learned a little bit. I hope you grew, have grown in your relationship with Him and learned more about Him and the, uh, how He works in your life. Um, but it's been, uh, it, it's been a good journey. It's been fun. And so we bring that together uh, today. We started this off by linking God the Father with the Son, Emmanuel, God with us. He came to earth in the form of a, a fully God, fully man, Jesus. And we talked about his, Him being Savior. He saves us from ourselves, right? Yeah, we need saved from ourselves. I need, Brian needs saved from himself. And uh, there's a lot of people in this room that can attest to that. Right? Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, sanctifier, that process, that ongoing process of being set apart, becoming more like Him, that we may do His work that He has set aside for us. And then last week, uh, Tim just did a, a phenomenal job of talking about Christ, our healer. And a, a lot went on last week, right? Uh, what, a, what a Sunday morning. It was probably one of my most favorite Sundays in a long time. Uh, I want to thank you uh, personally, uh, our first service people, for your patience. I know we went over a little bit, but uh, what I love about God is his timing's all different. He doesn't sit there looking at his watch. He's not looking at the, you know, he, he just, it's all, it's all different with him. And, um, uh, but thank you anyways, and, and we appreciate that. Um, but I, I just want to share with you a couple stories that I think you need to hear. Uh, just from what took place last week. Talked about Christ, our healer, that God still heals. That didn't end with what we read in Scripture. He is still doing that. And some of us, uh, we, don't, we don't understand how that works. Sometimes you, this person healed, not this one. And just, God, what are you, you doing? The reality is he is in control, and he knows exactly what he's doing. But if you were here, you saw that several people came forward and asked to be prayed over and asked to be anointed, as Scripture teaches us to do. And uh, we had our leadership up here and their wives, and I just, I, I stood back at one point and I, I told them, just marveled at watching them work, watching them interact, and uh, watching them just pray with people and care for them. And I want to share two quick stories with you. One of them, my friend Lil, she came forward and uh, she's dealing with some things in her life physically. And one of those things happened to be her lymph nodes that were enlarged. And they were just not sure why that is and what's going on there. And she came forward and there were several things that we prayed over her for. And we get word in the middle of this week she went back for a, a test to the doctor. Uh, I don't know what happened with the 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 x-rays or the the visuals but somebody can't read it right and another person can the doctor i don't know what happened but what i do know is that her lymph nodes are not enlarged anymore they have they have shrunk and uh there's there's one reason for that and we're pretty sure we know what it is that god did that there's some other things that need to happen and some tests that are going to take place there but you'll pray for her won't you i want to share another story my friend karen for over six months, Karen has been suffering from these, these tremors, these shakes that just come over her at one, two different times here in this church. Her whole body was shaking, and she just doesn't understand what's going on. A series of tests over and over again, and just don't know what it, what it was. Things are coming back clear. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense to the doctors. Confusion in that home. For over six months, wake her up at night. That's Sunday morning. Taking that opportunity, she came forward and she prayed with one of her elders and her wife, uh, his wife, anointed her. And we get word Monday morning, she has no more tremors. She has not had one since. Amen, huh? That's what God is doing. That's what God is doing. He's showing you that he is in control and he can do what he says he can do. And the same God of the Bible is the God that we serve today. God is healer. This morning we want to look at another attribute of God. And before we get going with that, I want to start by asking you a question. I think it's a question that I can, for the most part, I think I know the answer to it. 
Although there are some crazy people that answer the other way, but how many of you like to wait? Yeah, right? I met somebody who did once. It was all I could do within me not to smack him. you got to be kidding me. I mean, nobody likes to wait, right? So if I were to ask you this, I want to give you three scenarios and think about how long would you wait before you would complain or you just outright leave, all right? First one is you're at a fast food restaurant. How long do you wait before you complain and you leave? Most people, maybe 10 minutes is what the average is. How about the doctor's office? Now, we'll wait about 45 minutes there, won't we? <laughs> Give or take. How about you're at the airport and you're going to pick up one of your friends? How long do you wait? I mean, come on, you wait forever. I mean, you're not going to sit there, the flight got delayed, and you find out, well, forget him, I'm going to leave. i got a lot of things to do, right? Nah, you're not going to do that, right? You're going to wait for him. But we, we just don't like to wait. Just uh, this past week, my, my oldest son, Tyler, and I, we, were, uh, we just got done with one of his games. He had a baseball game, and uh, mom's away, so dad can't cook, and I didn't feel like making omelets. So I said, let's just run through McDonald's, right? So uh, we, get to, we get to McDonald's. And honestly, let me just say, disclaimer, uh, if you're in a hurry and you go to McDonald's, stay away from the one in Bridgeville. Just, man, oh man, It'll take forever. So there's two lines. They all got two lines now. We're in the left line, the left, yeah, left line, and, and I should have been in the right because I would have been ahead of the guy in front of me. But I get in the left, two cars in the right. We get up there, get this guy, and then, you know, alternate. It's the way it's supposed to work. This guy goes... This guy goes, I was supposed to go, nope, we went to this guy. There's nobody else behind him now. I've got two people behind me. Next comes another car up here. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, nothing. Takes his order. You know, I'm doing one of these things, right? Like it makes a difference, like who's looking at me? You know, I'm looking around. He goes. Another car comes up, I'm waiting. Take his order. By now, I'm yelling into the microphone. Hello! Four people have gone ahead of me, right? So that person goes, nobody else in line now, three people behind me. I said, Tyler, get out and walk over there. So he gets out, he walks over, he's standing in front of the microphone. Apparently they can't, I don't know if it's a, it's a weight thing, it's a sound thing, they, they have no ideas there. Now nothing's happening, no orders are being taken at all. I pull up, I back up into that side now. Guy behind me pulls up behind me. Takes his order. I said, you have got to be kidding me. Just as I put it in drive, she comes on. May I help you? I said, not now. I pull out and I said, here, have an invite to Easter next week. <laughs> but I mean, we don't, we don't like to wait. Right? And that's happened to me before. Not quite like that, but I keep going back there. It's like this weird sin within me. So we were thinking about this week, you know, this whole idea of waiting. And we're like, how do you do it? Why do you get, we get up so upset over it? And we thought, you know what, what would be a better way to get some insight in this whole waiting game than to talk to our experts? So we did. We sat down with our experts, and we'll let you see what, the, what they had to say. Today, mom was packing up the car, and I and I just sat in my bed watching cartoons, just waiting patiently. Why not? Because I'm not really patient. Because I like one thing's right that minute. When it's a fun thing, and mommy and I are talking about something with another sister, then I get like. I keep asking and they say, hold on, hold on. And then sometimes when they're kissing, I try to squeeze through the middle of them since they won't talk to me. It's because they're just talking and kissing. I was like, when are you ever going to listen to me? It's like odd. Like waiting for baseball practice in the car. We, I was waiting for mom to get the subs. Daddy, when's mom going to get out? 
Daddy, when's Mom gonna get out? When are we going to Happy? I kept asking, when are we gonna be there? When are we gonna be there? When are we gonna be there? And Mommy and Daddy are in a conversation that if the foot is, then you should always wait. But if it's not that foot, you, you don't really have to wait, but you should. You know, I, I, I don't understand. You're trying to get through to mom and dad, right? And they're kissing. I mean, come on, mom. I got a question here. Squeeze. <laughs> Never happened to me growing up, so I don't know what that's like. But we don't, we don't like to wait. And what's interesting is really nobody does. It's all through Scripture. And we see that at this time a couple thousand years ago when people were waiting for the king. They were waiting for that king on earth. And then that Palm Sunday, that glorious day, here he comes. He comes in on a donkey. He comes in with peace and comfort, what that donkey represented. And, and his, his notoriety was increasing. His popularity was next thing to going viral because he had just ra- risen, uh, risen raised, raised Lazarus from the dead. And everybody's seeing this and these wonders and these miracles like, wow, what is, what is happening? And so he comes in and they're laying palm branches down. They're laying coats down. And it's, it's fulfilling prophecy from Zechariah 9. I'm so excited. Hosanna, son of the, the King David. And yet in his mind, he knows what has to happen. Because just one week later, many of those same people would put him on that cross to die. But again, we knew, know that death could not hold him. And he rose again. And he did. He rose again. And in Acts chapter 1, he's having a conversation with his, his disciples. And he's telling them, listen, I've got to go now. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm going to heaven. But, but don't worry. I'm going to send the Comforter. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And when I do that, you are going to be my witnesses. You're going to do it here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and you're going to do it the whole way across the earth. And so as you can imagine, those disciples are watching this and they're still watching and they're still watching and he's in a cloud now, he's gone, but they're still watching. Is he coming back? Andrew, what's, is he, what's, what's he doing? Is he, he's got to come back, right? And then Scripture tells us in verse 11, two angels come down and they look at the disciples and they say, why do you stand there looking in the sky? This same Jesus who has been taking from you to heaven will come back in the same way that he left. He'll come back. Jesus is coming back. Now to set this up, I want to give us a little bit of insight because there's a lot that our scripture tells us about this, but there's a lot that it doesn't. And that's where faith and trust comes in to say, okay, here are the knowns. This is what Scripture tells us. But a lot of the other details, all right, I'm not really sure what that's going to be like. And I think God does that purposely to help us as we anticipate that. But here's what we know. Just a few things to kind of give us a little bit of perspective. This second coming will be the greatest event ever Bar none. It will be the greatest event in human history, hands down. Things that have been prophesied in this book, in our Bible, is happening today. These things are happening today. And Scripture tells us that all of this is going to be preceded by Revelation 16, this battle that we call Armageddon. This battle of Armageddon. Basically, this this antichrist, this individual, this person, is, is roaming the earth, And begins to take up residency to where he wants to get as much power as he can. And so as Daniel talks in in, in Daniel, I believe, 11, 7, 11, Daniel, 7, that's a, now I'm thirsty. And somewhere in, somewhere in Daniel, scratch all that. He talks about the enemies, the the armies from the north are coming, the armies from the south are coming. Yeah, Daniel 11. And and they're, they're converging on this Antichrist. And his whole purpose is to gain trust and eventually sever ties with Israel. 
And so we read that these things are happening, and then the East gets involved, and, and as it all comes together, there's a battle with the Antichrist. Daniel 11, Zechariah 14. Satan, using this, is trying to destroy Israel against what God has talked about in his word. And so Satan is bringing all these nations together. God is allowing this to happen to fulfill the prophecy, to fulfill, fulfill his word. The Antichrist will set up himself as God to break the covenant with Israel. There'll be an abomination that causes desolation that we read about. He's performing all of these miracles and signs. He's tricking people into believing that he is God. And at the point, and at the point where he basically has world domination is when the fun begins. It's showtime. Because as we read about in 1 Thessalonians 4, look at this with me. This period of time will happen, and then Scripture tells us Jesus will come back. Verse 13, Brothers, we do not, do not want you to be ignorant about these things and those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. Now I want to pause for just a second. Because if you're like me, you, you might go back to, to 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 5, where we talk a lot about those who, who have died, who are believers, who have given their life to, to Jesus. They've died, and, and Paul talks about being absent from the body. Being absent from the body, you are now in heaven, you are present with the Lord. And we believe that. As Jesus hung on that cross, he's talking to the one thief who said, he's, he, the thief is scolding the other one, you remember that. You know, we deserve to be here, he told the other guy. This man, Jesus does not. And you remember the thief looks at Jesus, or at least he, he tries, and if you, if you study the Scriptures and study Roman uh, means of crucifixion, they had this down to an art. You know, you're hanging there just to move your head. Had to have been excruciating pain. And, and, and the thief looks at Jesus, or at least he tries to, and remember me when you enter your kingdom. Jesus says, today, today you will be with me in paradise. And so we know that, but Paul goes on and talks about, okay, well, we're not just going to be naked up there. We're going to have these tents or where there's going to be some kind of covering around us. Our spirit is in heaven. But at this time, we will not have our glorified bodies that the Bible clearly teaches to be in the presence for eternity with our Savior and our Lord. So our spirits are there, but our bodies are in the ground or, or some, in some cases have been cremated waiting for Jesus to come back. 1 John 3.2 talks about that. John's saying we're not really sure what it's going to look like or what our, our bodies are going to be like. Are we young? Are we old? Or, or what exactly? But we will be like Him, Jesus, and be able to see Him and be in the presence of Him, our Almighty. And so we're waiting for that. And so as, as Paul is talking about here, this is going to happen. Those that have fallen asleep, those that have preceded us in death. Look at verse 16. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I mean, it's going to get loud. It's going to get loud when he comes back. The trumpets are blaring. People are, are cheering. And he comes back and the, the Scripture says the dead in Christ will rise receive their glorified bodies, we then who are still alive when that day comes, we will rise with Him. Scripture makes it very clear though, we do not know when that day will happen. So that battle has taken place and now Jesus is coming back in all of His glory 
And we do not know when that day will happen. He says, come like a thief. People have tried to predict it over the years. Hasn't worked out too well for him, has it? He will come back. Two things I want to get out of these verses for us this morning. Two key points I believe we can, we can glean from these verses. And the first is this, that Christ's return will be both personal and it will be visible. As, as the, the angels were saying in, in Acts chapter 1, as you see him leave, he will come back that way. Revelation 1, 7 says we will all, all the world will see him. I don't know what that looks like. Is he like revolving around the sun? I, I don't really know how, but it says we all will know that it's him. We all will see him when he comes back. 1 Thessalonians, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. So it's going to be both personal and it's going to be visible. We all will see him. Second thing is this. His, turn, his return will be in person and it will be in glory and in all truth. It will be in glory and in all truth. He will come as king. He is our king. What will that be like? Wonder about that. Scripture gives us some insight to that. It doesn't tell us everything. But it's true and it's known that he will come back as king. You ever thought about being a king? We have some perceptions of what it means to be a king. We've read about it, seen some movies maybe, stories, sitcoms, whatever. What would it be like to be king? What would it be like to, to see a king in all of his glory? Well, once again, we decided to get some help from our experts. Take a look. Um, they wear a prince hat. Uh, they mostly rule the kingdom. They have royal crowns on their heads. They sometimes wear quilts on their back. Um, not many countries around the world have um, many more kings or more kings anymore. Well, will they rule the they world? In their race, like they live in a castle. They live in a castle with horses and a pond around it. Sometimes they boss people around and say you have to do this, you have to do that. They live in a castle and they wear crowns and coats. They like tell people like, like, get me this, get me that. They have a wife that's a queen. Sometimes they have kids that are um, princes and princesses. Sit in my bed and relax and watch movies all the time. I would sit in my throne and just have a maid clean my castle. <laughs> I would not be one of those real queens or kings, and I would like clean my maids if they do anything. And sometimes I'll let them do I'm it for you. Imagine if you were a king. Yeah, I'd have a golden bed. I think my favorite part is I'd have maids, and sometimes I'd pay them, and then sometimes I'd just let them do it for free. <laughs> it's your privilege to work for me and serve me, right? Oh, man, we can get so much truth from that. But Jesus will come back. He's allowed all of this to take place. Satan has gathered everybody together. And the Antichrist has fooled them into thinking that he, he cares about him, he cares about Israel, and he severs ties with it. And Jesus comes back. He comes back different than he came the first time. I want us to make sure we understand that. This isn't baby Jesus. This is King Jesus. Look at Revelation 19 with me. I don't think we have it on the screen. Let me just highlight a couple verses. He says this, I saw, just as John seeing this, heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true with justice. He judges and makes war. His eyes are blazing fire in his head, many crowns. His name written on the, 
uh, on him that no one knows but himself. He's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. His name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses. Can you imagine this? White signifying the victory has been won. And the armies of heaven are coming. He treads the winepress of fury and the wrath of God Almighty on his robe. And watch this, on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is no one higher. The event of all events. The King of all kings. He will come. And there will be victory when this happens. How do we respond to this? What should we be doing? How do we react to this knowledge that we have? Let's go to the book of Titus for some help. Titus chapter 2. Let's read these together, these verses together, starting in verse 11. It says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now Paul is writing to this his his confidant, his, his apprentice, Titus, person he can trust. And a whole lot of things happen in this, this small book. But in this, he has given some instruction, the fact that Jesus will come back. And here are some things that you need to be doing. A couple things I want to grab out of these verses as we kind of bring this together. The first thing is this. I believe Paul is saying that we need to live godly lives. We need to live godly lives. Like we said, all through Scripture, we don't know the day or time. We don't know when He's going to, become, he's going to come. But it says, you are to be ready. It says, be ready. And in order to be ready for the second coming, we need to be able to respond to the first coming. Jesus came as a baby. He came and He lived on earth. 30 plus years, he died, he rose again. By believing in him and professing his name as Lord, Scripture says we will be saved. Have you responded to that first coming? Have you responded to Jesus as Savior? Is he your Lord? Are you, are you moving in that direction? Are you you've, a part of that process that says, God, I want to be set apart for your, for your work in my life? Because when we have responded to that first coming, the second coming, it says we need to be ready for it. Be ready because it could happen at any time. I've shared this story so many times, I know, but just indulge me for a minute because I can't find a better one. I love it. In reading one of his books, Francis Chan, he's sitting in that, that theater with his wife and mother-in-law. You remember this, some of you? And he's sitting in this and he tells his story so vividly. He remembers it from years before. And it's a, like a, a, an opera or something like that. Almost like if we'd be at the Benedum or Heinz Hall. And he looks over at his mother-in-law and she's so agitated. She's just nervous. She just, she can tell she's not comfortable. He says, Mom, are you okay? What's the matter? She leans in. I don't know if this is where I want to be when Jesus comes back. Wasn't expecting that. But wow, to be so ready, to want to be so ready, and everybody around to be part of that. Have you responded to Jesus? Then be ready. Second thing is this first, live godly lives. Secondly, live expectantly. Live expectantly. In Paul's letter to those in Rome and in Corinth talks about waking up, be watchful, guard against temptation, for the end is near. John is describing in Revelation chapter 16 what he's seeing. 
And in verse 15, Jesus says this, Behold, I, Jesus, come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake. Blessed is he who stays awake. In other words, keep watch. Now, we've all watched things. We'll go to sporting events. We'll turn the TV on. Something that Kim and I, we have, we have several shows that drive my kids crazy because uh, there's just like, you know, three, four, five shows that we love to watch. And two or three of them happen the same night, so we kind of monopolize the DVR. You know, we can only tape two at one time, so when you're taping two shows on two different TVs, you can't watch anything live, and it's just a whole mess, right? You'll pray for me. And so in the evenings when we finally get the kids to bed, we just want to sit down and just be lazy. I'm on one couch, she's on another. We might be eating something. She might have her phone. We're watching. Sometimes I can't even figure out how I remember anything that I watched. I am just so relaxed, so dead to the world, you know? And yet that is so opposite of what Jesus is saying here and Paul is instructing us. Because what he's saying is to be watchful is an active thing. It's not a passive thing. Being watchful, being ready is active. What are you doing? What are you saying? How is your life modeling the fact that Jesus is coming back? And he's coming as king. We are to be watchful, meaning we are to be doing, not just sit back and just wait. Live expectantly that he is coming. Third thing is this, li- li- is this, live with a purpose. Live with a purpose. Knowing this, believing this in your heart. I mean, you think about it, when you really believe something, how does that affect your life? How does that affect your decisions? When you believe in someone, You develop a level of trust in them. That they are who they say they are. They'll do what they say they'll do. When you believe in something, you'll do everything. You're all in. You know, I mean, you you watch sporting events. Our our penguins, we got to win today. This is bad. And you follow hockey, I mean, we're down 2 nothing. But that game today, those fans will flood that building. It will be jam-packed. They will be waving towels. They'll have their black and gold on. They will be screaming. The penguin mascot will be banging his drum. I mean, it'll be crazy because they believe in them. And because they're there, they will win. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you are like that. You yell at your TVs. What's it do wrong? But when you have that passion, when you believe in that, it changes you. It motivates you. Think about having that kind of passion and pursuit and purpose in your life for the fact that Jesus is coming back. And it could happen in the next two minutes. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen next year. It's going to happen. How does that affect your life at home? Moms, dads, how is that affecting your life with your kids? Are you spending time together? Are you praying together? Are you getting in the Word together? Do they know what you know because of how you live your life? How does that affect our relationships with people in our lives? Co-workers, family members outside of the home. Do they see what you know? Do they know what you see? Being a part of this church, I just, I love this church. I love our people. I love our leadership. I love the fact that our heart is for Him and Him alone, and we want to see Him magnified. We want to see Him glorified in this community, and that's why we're so aggressive trying to get into our community and, and, and what we say, expanding our influence, that God, we're not just bound to this space. Right now, there's a Spring Fest happening. It actually looks really cool. I kind of wish I was back there. And just seeing kids through different means and different things that happen, learning the Word of God. 
Wednesday night seeing 100 kids in this space. Every room basically being used. Except for upstairs. I don't think we're allowed up there yet. Youth flooding that whole section on the other side of that wall. Teenagers everywhere. See, our women's ministry is flourishing. Our men's ministry is getting off the ground now. And other things that we want to see God do. That's what you're a part of. You're the reason for that. Are you living with a purpose? Are you sitting there thinking, man, I can do more? Get on our website. Go to the connect piece and down to opportunities. And look at ways that you can serve in our ministries. Well, Brian, I'm, I just can't do this. I'm not good at this. I don't try it anyway. Maybe, just maybe, God will bring something out of you you never knew you had. Maybe he'll bring a gift out of you, a talent that you never knew you had. Maybe he'll bring a joy out of you that you didn't realize you had for something. To live with a purpose, not just sit back and every, doesn't it get old? Did you ever think about that? It's like you wake up and we're like machines sometimes. Get up, get the coffee, drink three pots of that, get the kids, go to work, do this, come home, get the kids, go to bed, and get up in the morning and do it all over again. Man, got to be more to life. To wake up and say, God, it's another day you've made. Let's go. I know you're coming back. I know who you are in my life, and I want everybody around me to see it. Man, that changes things. Church, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is our Savior to save us from our sins ourselves. He is our sanctifier, making us more and more like Him, being holy as He is holy. He is our healer. He healed us from the inside out, and He still heals physically, mentally, spiritually today. And church, He is our coming King. And oh, man. That's got to be worth celebrating. Amen? Come on. Church, would you stand with me this morning? We're going to do things a little different this morning. We're just going to end it right here on a high note. Huh? Why not celebrate? I can't think of a better reason. Let me pray for us. And I encourage you to put your hands together. This is an oldie but a goodie. I think you'll like it. If you don't pretend, we don't care. Lord Jesus, thank you for your promises in your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can cling to your word. And that you are who you say you are and you will do what you say you will do. Lord, we can see it. We can see it in the world today. Prophecy. What has been said in Daniel, Zechariah, Revelation, these things are happening. Your return is imminent. God, may we be ready. May we be watchful. And may we draw people to you. God, now hear our praises as we celebrate this. May you be praised. May you be exalted and glorified in this place.